William Frederick Gertis Sr. William Frederick Gertis Sr. was not the first president of Michaelman Steel Construction Company, but his success in changing the company product line in the early 1900s re-established purpose for the then struggling company and significantly impacted many commercial structures in the Quincy area. Gertis was born in St. Louis, Missouri on July 7, 1873. His father abandoned the family when he was a teenager. And he actually had to go to work then full time to support his family at age 13 or 14. So obviously that wasn't an easy uh, teenage years for him, but I think it really made him who he was later on. With very little formal education, Gertis went to work for Union Iron and Foundry and worked his way up to superintendent. He met the daughter of J.H. Michaelman at a YMCA function, and he and Clara Michaelman wed in 1899. They moved back to Quincy in 1903, and he joined the family business. The company was founded in 1865 as Michaelman Boiler Company. What began as a successful business was falling on hard times. But at the time that he moved back to Quincy, Boilers were, I guess, starting to go out. I don't know what was replacing them, honestly, maybe natural gas or something. Um, but it was, the business was struggling at that time. Boilers just weren't a big thing. Well, he brought all that knowledge from St. Louis, from Union Iron and Foundry, and he had experience with carbon steel and fabricated structural steel, and that's the direction that he took the company in, and that was the right direction to go. Gertis became president of the company in 1923, and he was instrumental in starting two new company divisions, Tri-State Steel Erectors, which erected steel on-site, and Mid-State's Door and Hardware, a wholesaler of doors, hollow metal frames, and hardware. I think the diversification, too, opening the two divisions, really helped the company move forward as well. Steel fabrication has not changed a lot in a very long time. There are some more modern things, but we still do a lot of things the same way they did them, amazingly enough. Michaelman Steel became the primary steel fabricator and erector in the tri-state area during his tenure, contributing to some of Quincy's most recognizable structures, including what is now Quincy Junior High School, the former Illinois State Bank Building, the Western Catholic Union Building, and First Union Congregational Church, among others. Naturally, Michaelman Steel and Gertis played a significant role in the construction of Quincy Memorial Bridge in 1928. He was a consulting engineer on the project, and apparently he also sat on the company as a director on the company that ran the bridge when it was first built. And he's always mentioned in connection with the bridge as having been rather integral to bringing the first highway bridge to Quincy. Gertis was known and respected by steel industry executives nationwide. He was active in the American Institute of Steel Construction, Western Society of Engineers, Central Fabricators Association, and Business Executives of America. His biography was listed in Who's Who in Engineering, Who's Important in Business, Who's Who in Chicago and Illinois, and Who's Who in Transportation and Communication, he was a leader of the American Institute of Steel Construction. His whole family and everyone else just really respected him. They said that he was a very unpretentious person and that he was very moral and uh, just very well thought of and respected in both the Quincy community and the the business community, even the national business community. Gertis was equally as active in civic affairs. He served on the Quincy School Board and on the Board of Directors for Central Illinois Public Service Company. He was on the Mercantile Board of Directors for more than 20 years and served as its first vice president. He helped to start the Michaelman Foundation, which makes charitable grants in the tri-state area, and he headed many fundraising drives for various causes, he served terms as president of the Quincy Chamber of Commerce, the Illinois State Chamber of Commerce, the Quincy Freight Bureau, and the Quincy YMCA. He was a member of Rotary for many years. A member of Salem Evangelical and Reformed Church, he served as president of the congregation and served on the board of the Evangelical Old Folks Home Association. He was emotionally and financially supportive of his wife's efforts to co-found Good Samaritan Home. William and Clara Gertis had three children. Their two sons entered into the family business. 
He was extremely family oriented and maybe because his father left him at a young age, you know, I think it was his goal to be a good father and a good husband and family always came first with him and I think he accomplished that very well. William Gertis Sr. died in Quincy on March 7, 1952. Andy Nicholson. When Andy Nicholson accepted a position at Damon Hurdle Jewelers, Quincy's downtown was the epicenter for shopping in the tri-state region. Little did Nicholson know that he would spend most of his career working to revitalize the popularity of what is now the historic Quincy Business District. Born September 1, 1934 and raised on a farm near Pena, Illinois, Nicholson joined Ken Dame and Dick Hurdle's family jewelry business in 1964. With Nicholson's enthusiasm and endless supply of ideas, the business quickly reached beyond the Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa market and drew clients from all over the country. Dame and Hurdle became one of the few independent retailers in the country that bought directly from gem cutters and mounted stones in their own designs. They carried Rolex watches, Yadro and Beam porcelain, and Mont Blanc pens. In 1980, Nicholson and his family finally purchased the store from its founders. Integrity, service, and fun were at the heart of their success. You know, good service, good quality merchandise, and um, being there. He knows his business. I knew that his word was gold, and, and the people that he worked with and around knew that if he said something, it, it was true. And of course, you know, the customers, you know, they, they trusted us. He lives by the philosophy, laugh a lot. And he does a lot of laughing. So, um, you know, that's his philosophy. Laugh a lot, you'll live a long time. At the same time as Quincy residential areas were developed on the east side of town, the center of community activity swung away from the central business district. Nicholson worked tirelessly with downtown Quincy organizations, the City of Quincy, and the Great River Economic Development Foundation to ensure that everything possible was being done to attract business and shoppers to the downtown area. That's what I admire most about him was his tireless energy and always coming up with this promotion, that promotion, bouncing it off our board down there. Some of them were kind of far out there and some of them we may not have done but at least he was a thinker and doing everything he could to always bring business down into the Central Business District. He's a promoter, he's a hustler. Andy is resilient, he, uh, he is never has, he's always got a smile on his face and the last thing he'd always say to me is, you know, work hard and make money. He wasn't afraid to work. And work he did. He was active in the Quincy JCs, Uptown Quincy Incorporated, the Quincy Area Chamber of Commerce, Great River Road Parkway, Friends of the Castle, the United Way of Adams County, and the Quincy Convention and Tourism Bureau. He served on the Adams County Fair Board for seven years and was one of the co-founders of the Dogwood Festival. He has done much to promote literacy programs that address the educational needs of minorities and children living in poverty, and at one time he owned the Miss Quincy pageant to make scholarship opportunities available for young women in the Quincy area. He was active in starting a SCORE chapter in Quincy, a nonprofit organization dedicated to entrepreneur education, and he was appointed by the Governor of Illinois to serve on the Small Business Advisory Committee to begin the incubator program in Quincy. The Governor of Kentucky named him a Kentucky Colonel for his generosity in assisting a young girl with Down syndrome and the Quincy JCs named him the 1979 Boss of the Year for his service work in promoting and improving Quincy as a place to live and work. He, he just thought it was important to, to be involved, not just to promote the downtown, but to promote the entire town. He, he thought it was important to support the businesses in Quincy, the homeowned stores, and it was, it was not something that he was doing just because it was good for business. It was good for the community. You know, he tried to promote the community as much as, as you know, the businesses. Nicholson's greatest gift to his community came in 1994 with the opening of the Main Center at 535 Main. The two-story structure offers almost 30,000 square feet of retail and office space and houses anchor stores Joseph A. Bank and Dame Hurdle and Company Jewelry Store. The project has been a major boost for the downtown area. You know, it's one thing to be a cheerleader of an organization, but it's another thing to make the financial commitment that he did to the Central Business District. He had to swallow hard to be able to make that kind of an investment. And it was a great thing for Quincy. 
and that has certainly been the cornerstone, I think, that has kept redevelopment going downtown. Twice a widower, Nicholson and his wife Jeannie were married in 2005 and now live in Florida, where he continues to be active in his church and score. I admire his enthusiasm, uh, his, his outlook on life. The family is very important to him and, and his, his belief in God. And, um, and I admire the fact that he's not afraid to tell you what he thinks. He's got a great sense of humor and you know he's a man of his word. He's a fair man. Uh, a man of his means and influence uh, could be uh, prejudiced, he could be um, um, selective, and, uh, but he's a fair man. Uh, um, I've never sensed him looking down on anyone. I think he values people and I think he gives people value. I think people feel valued in his presence. Andy Nicholson is a rare gem for our business community. Clyde H. Gus Trader. Gus Trader loves the thrill of the sale. From agricultural products to motorcycles and golf cars to the city of Quincy, his career in sales is legendary. Born August 9, 1925 on a farm in Rome, Wisconsin, Trader went to work for Montgomery Ward in 1947 and was offered the job as manager of the Montgomery Ward Farm Store at 927 Main in Quincy when he was only 24 years old. Within two years, the business became the number one farm store in the nation. In 1958, the store held a promotion during which vendors showcased new products. One vendor brought a small vehicle called a go-kart, and Trader's life changed forever. When Montgomery Ward decided the carts didn't fit in with the other products, Trader started his own business and sold them out of his garage at night. He also raced the vehicles on a track near Payson, Illinois. He always would bring about six carts and he'd win every class. The owner of the track didn't like him for doing that, so there was some bumping going on at one of the races and he, he banned Gus for 30 days from racing out there. So he said, nope, you're not going to do that. I'll build my own track. In 1960, Gus and his wife and business partner, Fern, found a site in West Quincy, Missouri, and built TNT Cartways, named after his children, Terry and Tamara. It was the finest go-karting facility in the nation at the time. Professional drivers and local enthusiasts alike frequented the track. TNT was awarded the 1962 National Karting Championship, and 17 national events followed, with the last one held in 1994. When we started out, we weren't nowhere even even competitive. We was lucky if we just made the races when we got to where we was at. But, but, but Gus stayed with us and he said, we'll do what we got to do to get better. And we stayed some years. And first thing you know, Terry was probably one of the best drivers in the nation. And it just went from there. Trader's most well-known race, the Grand Prix of Karting, started as a unique activity for the Dogwood Festival in 1970. The beauty of South Park, the challenging track layout, and the number of spectators were unique to the sport. It was dubbed the best track layout in karting history. And Gus, there's nobody like anybody could put on a race like he could. He could promote it and run it, announce it, he could do it all. It was, you know, you'll just never find a promoter like he is. The Grand Prix reached its pinnacle in 2000 when it had more than 600 entries and a $30,000 driver purse. The infusion of tourist dollars into the local economy was significant. Every hotel and, and motel in Quincy was full. Every hotel in Hannibal was was full. Anywhere they could stay, you know, was was full. The restaurants and the bars, I mean, they had a heyday because the carters came, so they would spend a lot of money. Another landmark moment in karting and track history was in 1966 when ABC Wide World of Sports televised the national championships from TNT. It was the only time in history that karting was televised nationally by a major network. Television legend Jim McKay was the lead broadcaster. There were more than 500 entries at the event. In 1964, the traders acquired the Harley-Davidson motorcycle franchise. They weren't enthusiasts and, in fact, didn't even know how to ride motorcycles. He could look beyond what was going to happen, you know, you know, especially with the motorcycles. He, you know, when they took them on, how did he know that it was going to grow like it did, you know? He, he wasn't afraid to take a chance. They added Yamaha and Honda products and opened a separate dealership in Quincy. 
Following a fire, the businesses merged back together, and the West Quincy location became one of the largest volume motorcycle dealerships in the Midwest, with sales of 2,500 motorcycles per year. During his years in the motorcycle business, he was an officer on the board of directors with both the Illinois and Missouri dealer associations. Hard work and persistence can really make up for a lot of misfortune. Not all misfortune, of course, but um, I watched them lose their business twice or three times, uh, two, to a two to floods and one to a fire. And they just, there wasn't a question of, well, should we go on or should we quit? It was just, we just kept going. And so, I could see that even when really bad things happen, you, you can often make up for it by just not stopping. Soon TNT added golf cars to its product line. Trader and his son Terry became consultants for the design of the Yamaha golf car, and TNT was given the first prototype for testing. In 1977, TNT became the first Yamaha golf car distributor in the nation, and golf cars now are a major portion of the business. Trader retired in 1995, and in 2007, his son moved the business to its current location at 930 May. From 1982 to 1984, Trader took the idea of street racing to a national level. He acquired the Professional Karting Association and held a national championship racing series in major venues like California, New York, and Florida. In 2003, he promoted the first vintage karting event in the nation, which is still held today at TNT Kartways. Trader has been elected to the Racing Hall of Fame in Talladega, Alabama, and is the inaugural member of the Vintage Racing Hall of Fame. I think it's often hard for us to set out on a path that might be very different from our family of origin, and uh, he has really carved out a life that is unique to him and that he's enjoyed every minute of. So, he has followed the path of his heart. Trader has been an active booster of the Quincy University and Quincy High School basketball programs. He has been inducted into the QHS Sports Hall of Fame. He is a golf enthusiast who plays many tournaments and is always looking for a game and a bet. He and Fern are retired and spend their winters in Florida. Bernard H. Bernie Willer. Bernie Willer, former owner and president of Quincy Hardy's Restaurants, leveraged his business success into decades of unselfish giving, especially to causes that enhanced education and youth activities. 